welcome to the commentary booth where we watch and you guessed it, commentate on the week that was in movies and TV. I'm your host and play-by-play commentator, Jamie Apps, and each week I'm joined by a rotating cast of colour commentators to help you find your next viewing treat. This week we're doing a special episode breaking down the multitude of sports documentaries that have hit streaming services this year. For this episode, I'm joined by two special guests. First up is the all-round sports fanatic, but most notably a golf tragic. Welcome to the show, Ben Davis. Okay, everyone, how we going? <laughs> and then next up, the rock climbing, cycling, tennis fiend. Welcome to the show, Jordan Pinney. All right, thanks for having me. How's, how is the uh, rock climbing going? I feel like every time I go on Instagram, that's all you're doing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, really into it. Uh, it's been uh, it's been super fun. Uh, we've just gone through a very, very cold winter in the UK. So being able to do some social sport that doesn't involve being outside at any moment is uh, is quite handy. What are you talking about? You go for a yeah, ride or a run to... every second day. <laughs> don't say you're bloody... Oh, don't... <laughs> yeah, but I think that's, uh, you know... <laughs> yeah, if, if he's not trying to climb up a wall, if he's riding a bike through the snow. <laughs> yeah. Just lots of lots of lots of layers. See, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, as sports fans, we've been treated to a plethora of sports documentary series on streaming services this year. Like previously, we sort of only ever got hard knocks or all or nothing, and we get maybe like one a year. This year, we got a bunch with a bunch of different sports. So we got season two of the test focusing on the Australian cricket team. We got Breakpoint focusing on the ATP and WTA tennis tours. Full Swing focusing on the PGA tour and like kind of live golf for a little bit as well. And then Formula One's Drive to Survive season five. Uh, there's also, what else have I seen? There's a, there's a surfing one on Apple TV as well. Yeah. There's a wrestling one on Apple TV. There's some... There's some crazy ones, right? Eh? There's really the smoker cool. ones, like the what's the Wrexham yeah. one? Um, oh, yeah, welcome to Wrexham. Welcome, welcome to Wrexham. To Wrexham. Yeah, so that's good. the one. Yeah, yeah. And then there's like there's I saw an I'm NRL super one. Keen for season two of that. Like yeah, there's a quite a few now. Ah, uh, welcome cool. to Tiger Town. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's some there's some cool ones. Um, Joey would have liked All or Nothing last year. Definitely. Yeah. Well, it was, it was a nice, uh, it was a nice warm up to, uh, to, to the success that Arsenal have seen this season. <laughs> Why did you say that? <laughs> Actually, hang on, we can vote. Nine it. to go. <laughs> I'm battling for Europe. Joey's going to win. Your what? Do you want your coach to, back? Trying to, no, he can stay with you. That's fine. <laughs> My new coach is better. <laughs> Do you want him back? Oh, you can have him. We'll pay you. You can. We'll pay you to have him back. Not a chance. Why Not did we chance. hire him? I, I have no idea what the thought process was there. He was doing really good for yeah, us. Yeah, he knows. Like Thomas Tuchel was doing really good for us. <laughs> uh, that was strange. Strange decisions. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, we'll we'll break down a few of these series. I think first up, we'll go very Australian, jumping into season two of The Test on Amazon Prime. Uh, did either of you watch season one of this show? I, I watched two or three episodes, but no, not really. Okay. So, yeah, I really enjoyed season one. Uh, it was eight episodes. The second season, I didn't enjoy as much and i think it was purely because it was only four episodes so i don't feel like they got to go into much depth on the stories that they told like they they focused on england versus australia here in australia and then the going to pakistan for the first time in decades and then during that we had the tim payne off-field incident and then the player disfad dissatisfaction with Justin Langer and yeah, I just felt like they didn't really get to go into much depth on any of those stories. It was kind of like, Oh, we've got one episode on each thing and then move on to the next thing. I think, what did you think of the season Davis? Well, I follow cricket pretty heavily. I started following it even more heavily, sort of the 
the year before last. So the first year of that, the test just before that, I think they had a lot of material for that, that first season and they were really trying to push the rebrand of Australian cricket. Okay. And so they probably had time and the budget and everything to dive more into those stories. And then this year they went, okay, sweet, let's just keep the momentum going, but we don't need to dive in as, as, as full on all of them. I actually think it was really good. I think it covered some points that we didn't hear about through the media and through other bits and pieces. Um, and I think it, I actually think it provided a lot of really good insights into how the, the inner workings of the, the teamwork and the dressing room and all that sort of stuff, which the first season probably did as well. But it was nice to see him continue along with it. Um, I actually really enjoyed it. I thought it was one of the better four that we watched. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I still enjoyed it. I don't think it was terrible. Like I wouldn't say don't worry about watching it. <laughs> I just think that. The first season was better, and like you said, I think it was that was probably a lot to do with yeah that that whole series was kind of built to try and fix the repu yeah. reputation of Australian cricket after the they were trying to paper incident. Yeah. Have, which... I mean, I, I I'd, I'd imagine, funnily enough, when more <laughs> when there's more scandals and that kind of stuff in the media it actually drives higher viewership of these programs, even though they're trying to do the opposite. Yeah. People are probably like, oh, yeah, I, I want to get all the behind-the-scenes details of, of you know, what that scandal was and how the other teammates reacted to it and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, well, I guess that that kind of plays into Formula One and the PGA full swing one as well this year. As you're thinking, as sure. talking about that, yeah, I mean, you're right. They probably could have dived into the whole Tim Payne, Captain into Cummins thing, like there was a whole big, massive thing of who are they going to make captain? Do they give it back to Steve Smith? Do they give it to, do they make Warner vice captain? Do they get someone completely left field, like a, a whatever, a um, Mitch Marsh or something, or do they really go a Cummins? And Cummins was clearly the best candidate outside of Smith, but the whole was the first bowl of whatever, 19, whenever the hell that was like, is it going to work for the test team? And then they, I think they could have gone into it more about the Adelaide test where Cummins was out after just being made captain and Steve Smith was captain. And yeah, they probably could have gone a fair bit more into it, but I, I think I probably didn't need it as much because I followed it when it was happening. And so people that maybe didn't yeah. follow it as much would have been like, oh, I would have really liked to know what happened to Cummins becoming captain. And yeah, like... I don't know. They probably just didn't even the, to do it as the much. Tim Payne stuff. Like they didn't they show why. over the Tim Payne stuff, but yeah. I think that is that was probably legal requirements of that where they couldn't say certain things. Yeah, mm. true. <clears throat> yeah. Joey would let, know all about sort of scandal management as advertising and marketing stuff <laughs> more more the pr world but yeah so to a degree <laughs> yeah but not just because so, of joey yeah instead. i think that's like... <clears throat> Mate, yeah joey's, joey's a scandalous <laughs> fella um yeah so i think that first season probably they did have a lot of help in terms of we are coming out of probably the most tumultuous time in australian sport and this is look here's a new show showing you exactly what happened yeah yeah. Uh, but like we said, the, the controversial stuff definitely helps. Uh, and then I think the full swing series focusing on the PGA tour in their eight episodes, they could have capitalized on that sort of situation way more than they did as well with the rise of live golf. Were you happy with how they portrayed that? Ben? No, I hated the whole series. That was the worst series of the I, four. I have heard that from, from <laughs> someone else. <laughs> Why did you hate it so much? I liked this one. Any number of reasons. They they had the, the most tumultuous season on the professional golf circuit in like 50 years. And they didn't do anything about it. They didn't show how the PGA Tour works. They barely lent into the majors. They showed the same major like five times. They... Mm -hmm. The PGA chant. They told us every single episode that it was 125 people and only people if you made the cut made money. Sick. I don't need to hear that every single time. 
um, <laughs> Rory McIlroy. If I'm seven episodes deep, I, I don't <laughs> know how it works. I, I've got it. <laughs> Rory McIlroy only coming in at the end. No Cameron Smith. Cameron Smith had a, as good a season as Scotty Scheffler and didn't get a look in. He won the biggest event the PGA Tour runs in the players. Didn't get a look in because he's gone to live. Part of me wonders of how much did the PGA Tour say, no, you can't show him. No, you can't have access to this. No, you can't have access to that. And part of me wonders how much did the players go, well, hang on, we don't we don't know what we're getting here. We don't want to give you too much. Um, and then there was dumb stuff like Colin Morikawa, one of the best iron players in the world, sitting there saying, I wouldn't wear those pants with that shirt. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> that made it? I guess I was just trying to like humanize him a little bit. <laughs> and I mean, golfers are not the most interesting people in the world either. So that definitely didn't help. Yeah, I guess. I The thing that blew me the most, blew me away the most was the, uh, the staggering amounts of, like I knew golf was a ridiculous sport for prize money. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap. Well, they didn't even speak about that. So this year, as in this season on the PGA Tour, they're doing, it's called a designated event. And the the um, prize pool is $20 million for one event, and there's eight of them. They were doing that last year, as in talking about it for this year, and there wasn't a peep in this show about this Delaware meeting. I heard them mention it twice. That Delaware meeting is the biggest mm. thing to happen in professional golf, possibly ever. And there was nothing about it. I heard it mentioned twice. Like, Yeah, I think it <laughs> wasn't until the Rory episode where it was brought up at all. <laughs> that is just like, how? When I went to the PGA Championship four times that year, like in the season, <laughs> we don't hear about that? Like, come on. Yeah, I know. I just, I was watching it and like every time they're like, oh, here's some random player that I don't know. Like, I know. Tony Finau or something and like they're finishing like 30th or something and still winning like half a million dollars. I'm like, I would happily be the 40th best player in the world and take half a million dollars every weekend. But that's also a bad show. Like Tony Finau is, he's a top 10 player in the world and has been for ages and he finishes 40th. Show how hard it is to win one of these freaking things. Like it's stupidly hard and they, they nothing. <laughs> I think. Anyway, I don't think it would have been that to... <laughs> I think if they could have got Tiger Woods, this show would have been massive as well. Yeah. Like they they had some big names in this, but I think they just needed like they either needed to put Rory's episode so early, yeah, or have a Tiger at the start and then mix in those sort of middling unknown guys and then end with Rory or something like that. Yeah, I think. The, the flip side to that is the breakpoint one. I really enjoyed the breakpoint one. And that didn't do a Nadal or a Djokovic thing. And I think that really worked for it. And I think they tried to yeah. do the same thing with this and it just didn't because golfers are just inherently not as exciting as tennis players. <laughs> yeah, especially when you kick off the uh, breakpoint one with... With Nick Kyrgios. Kyrgios. <laughs> just a yeah. mental case. Yeah. Yeah, like the mental cases in golf went to live and i mean there was a story there that you could have run and they just didn't yeah yeah i mean i would imagine that was pga being like we don't want to promote yeah. this 100%. rival tour at all like like the way uh live golf was portrayed in this was as this rebel offshoot that was really bad yeah <laughs> like there was definitely no like independent third party being like this is actually good for golf yeah, which I personally think it's not, but only because of the way they went about it. I think it's the right way to go. They live just went about it wrong, but that's a separate yeah, issue. Doing it. Like yeah. Sneakily behind everyone's back, <laughs> yeah. that thing with yeah. horrible funding and backing. Yeah, you're right. If they'd got Phil, they got Sergio, if they'd got Cameron Smith, if they'd got some of these bigger names to talk, maybe it would have been a different season. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing that, like I was mentioning with the, the prize money and stuff, the Jordan Spieth and Justin Thomas episode where they just took a 40-minute private flight to go and play a practice round of golf. Like, I like you this. guys have way too much money. 
No, the bit <laughs> that was that got me was the playing um, pick a card for a thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sitting on their private jet, pick a card, thousand bucks. Uh, oh, I won a thousand bucks. Yeah, they, they have way too much money. Uh, and then Justin Thomas going to the CVS and forgetting his card, not being able to pay for allergy medicine. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think he can afford it. He's gonna be fine. It's not like his card got declined because I have no money in it. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Like just, just watching them all just traveling around on private jets. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's easy to go to all of these tournaments that are all over the world when you're flying private all the time. Yeah, I don't think it portrayed professional golf in a great light. Yeah, it definitely made them look like... Yeah. It It made it look like the rich white guy sport. Yeah. Especially Which... what, there was two non-white guys in the whole, episode, whole season? <laughs> Three if you count uh, me, though. Yes. Yeah, Tony, Colin, and the... Um, Sahith. Yeah, that guy. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Definitely the rich white guy sport. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yeah, 100%. Did not help that image at all. I did like... Who was it? One of them where it dove into sort of the mental aspect of the sport where he was just like struggling hardcore. I think it was the, the Tony one where mm. he wasn't hardcore like all the other players where he Joel left his family at home and like he had he took his family with him he was struggling to make putts and stuff and even watching some of the players like have a massive lead going into the last day and then choke it up like one bad shot ruins their <clears> whole day so yeah that, that's a pretty accurate portrayal of playing golf 100 percent. i've just done it myself I mean, I... <laughs> I think that that kind of also seemed to to be a theme in uh, in in Breakpoint, where they'd have a lot of matches where you know they'd have a match point, and that for some reason would change their mentality a little bit. They'd lose that point and the next point, and then all of a sudden it just starts to unravel. And you know, the the, the it seemed to show quite a few times where someone was so close to winning, but then you know it kind of completely falls apart, which I guess is the more entertaining matches to <laughs> to recap. <laughs> It's not as fun watching like someone go six one six one six one. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, Indeed, like, yeah. Walk over. <laughs> I liked in one of those breakpoint episodes where the coach just decided I was just going to stand up, and that was yeah, enough to, just like, to do something totally different. Totally that changed was... the player's mind. Where they're like, "Why is he standing up?" That was yeah. Doing? That was that was hilarious. You know, yeah. moment of tactical genius. I'm just going to stand up in, stand in my up. seat. I'm going to piss the people off that have paid for their tickets behind me just to try and get my player to do something yeah. different. Yeah, no, the break point one was good. I think it dealt with that. It dealt with all that really well, and it did it without the big names. It did it without the Nadal and the Djokovic's talking. They were in it, mm -hmm. and, but they were in it enough that they were. They uh, were the, they were the side characters rock. to these. Yeah, pretty much like uh, yeah, guns. like um yeah. I, I I don't know how I felt about that about that bit because I think I found yes, it was super interesting to get you know, understand the personalities of all of tennis's, you know, bright, bright stars, you know, the, the kind of future of what the sport's probably going to be. But I couldn't help wondering, you know, seeing their training regime, seeing their personal life, you know, getting to know more of their personality. In the back of my head, I was like, I want to know this about Federer and Djokovic and, and Nadal, because obviously they've done something different to everyone. You know, they're just they're just on a completely another level. So for me, it would have been more interesting to be like, what's Nadal's personal life like? How does he prepare for these big tournaments? And, you know, I, I do remember Drive to Survive the first season. They didn't have Ferrari or McLaren, uh, sorry, Ferrari or Mercedes in there. Mm -hmm. There was no there was no Hamilton in there. So, you know, maybe it was just uh, they're, they're too big and, and powerful. And, you know, they're like, no, we don't want to do this for, for this first season. But I think, you know, the, the, the way they've positioned it has been much better because it, it makes sense to the narrative to focus on, you know, the young up and up and comers versus the, the people that, you know, probably not too, too many years away from, uh, from retiring. Yeah. yeah I, I know in, in drive to survive, I remember in that first season, there was a big issue that they didn't have those two teams. And apparently that came down to those two teams refusing to be Saying involved no. mm. because they weren't sure how formula one was going to be portrayed in this docudrama mm. series whether they'd spin things up and hype things up beyond what they actually were and yeah that, that carried through all the way until this most recent season season five where 
this was the first time Max Verstappen has actually spoken directly to Kemra in the season mm. because up until this point he was against how some of his actions and other stories had been portrayed in the series, but they finally got yeah. him on board after he won the world title. Yeah, yeah, yeah See, look, for sure. I, I thought that was the big difference between the test and Drive to Survive and the other two, in that the test and Drive to Survive is by a, a single body saying, like Cricket Australia and F1 going, well, we're doing this docuseries, get on board or get out. I didn't realise that they weren't like that. And that's why I thought the other two were slightly weaker in that it, it relied heavily on the buy-in from the players because they're that independent contractor. And like the PGA Tour said, hey, we're going to do this. Please get on. And everyone just went. <laughs> and the same with the tennis <laughs> tour. And it, like back to your point, Joe, yeah, it could have been that Nadal and Djokovic just went, eh, we don't need to do that. We've got enough followers. i got enough on my plate. I'm here to win majors. I don't mm-hmm. want to spend my time doing that. And I'd hope that now, maybe for season two or maybe even the back end of season one, they've gone, oh, shit, hang on. Maybe we do need to get on this. This is actually a good thing. Like, let's jump on it. And, and there's yeah. a full swing. Hopefully they do. Yeah, for, for sure. I think, you know, even if you're someone like Nick Kyrgios, who is obviously such a divisive character and, you know, is, is typically portrayed poorly in the media, I think that this uh, series has only done positive things for him, you know, and, and his reputation. I think, you know, people watching that are like, wow, this sport is insanely difficult and there is so much pressure on them. And, you know, if you're not in the top 30, you literally are, you know, fighting for, for every every game that, that you win because that could be the difference in you being able to afford to go to the next tournament and, and compete. And so, yeah, I, I think this one... Uh, everyone that has, the, the, everyone that I've seen that's been in there, I think the people that were already fans of them have probably liked them even more. And they've probably all gotten a huge amount of more followers and, and fans that are going to be rooting for them in their next tournament if they, you know, didn't kind of know of them previously. Perfect example of that is Taylor Fritz. Like I watch, I yeah. watch tennis intermittently throughout the season. I try and watch Indian Wells. I try and watch the Miami. I try and watch Madrid. Um, I was not a fan of Taylor Fritz. I was like, this guy's just a, to paraphrase the rich white boy. Arrogant American. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And then watching him play, I was like, okay, you're still a rich, arrogant American, but I actually know where you're coming from now. And I, I I actually like him now. I turn it on. I'm like, okay, is he winning? Is he doing this? Like, yeah, sweet. Um, Yeah. So I've definitely become a fan of him. I I loved Curious before this. This just makes me like him more. Um, Me too. Yeah. (laughs) And Berrettini, I really, I knew he was a really good player. I knew he was, one of these upper comers that needed to break through and was starting to get a bit older. Again, all it did was positive things for him for me. Yeah. yeah. I think maybe with the, the full swing and the break point one, getting those big names in would have been a lot harder because it is that like individual sport where you do need to be a hundred percent focused on mm. each match in each tournament mm. where, yeah, I guess with formula one, it's, it's kind of a team thing. Like, they get the drivers in for an interview like after the race weekend and stuff and then kind of just do a lot more focusing on the the team principles and stuff. So it's not yeah, as like, demanding on the drivers where if the team one, they're, they're trying to talk to these players every tournament and it's like, oh, geez, like, can you just let yeah. me focus on my matches? Yeah, like if McLaren had just gone, hey, we're buying into this, bad luck. I don't know who their driver was in season one. Bad luck, you've got to start talking. Like, mm. I can't say no, he's paying me $10 million. Like, like, I kind of have to say yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the reason that uh, Drive to Survive has been so popular and, and then obviously why uh, it, it's gotten so much attention and, and been copied by a lot of the other sports, Drive to Survive was so successful at the start because Formula One is just so complicated, right? There's so many intricacies of you know, how the car, the technology in the car and the race weekend strategy and, you know, the, the difference between practice and qualifying and, and the race each weekend. And so even without the drivers themselves doing a lot of, you know, uh, piece, pieces to camera, they had so much content to cover uh, that was really interesting for people that, you know, weren't diehard Formula One fans. Whereas I think that's a little bit harder to do in all these other sports because, yes, you can focus on the characters, but I did find some of the episodes of Breakpoint dragging on a little bit just because, you know, it's 50 minutes of 
you know, usually one of the male and one of the female stars. And it, you know, it just goes on and on into their personal lives and, you know, each individual game. And it is a little bit of rinse, repeat kind of, yeah. kind of thing. Whereas I found, you know, I was learning so much in, uh, in, in the formula one, even, even after already being a fan, I just think there's, there's so much more breadth of content that they can cover just purely down to how technical the sport is. Well, and you sort of get all that inner workings, like political intrigue between the teams to where they're, yeah, it's like trying totally. to work, totally. trying to work the rules against each other yeah. without like making it obvious. Buying into that fully, I've never watched an F one race before the Australian Grand Prix this year, and the only reason I watched it this year is because I watched season five of Drive to Spot. Legitimately, the only reason I could care less about this is because of that. I think F one had the advantage too that who doesn't like fast cars, good looking women, and exotic locations like. Seriously, you've got a race in Bahrain and a race in Las Vegas and a race in wherever the hell else they are, like Monaco. And, like, and these cars are going at 230k an hour or whatever it is. Like, who doesn't like that? <laughs> yeah, and yet the, the big crashes. Like, each episode of Drive to Survive is pretty full on and exciting. Like, mm. yeah, some of those golf and tennis episodes, like Joey said, were kind of like, okay, I get it. Old mate's struggling. I don't yeah. need to see him struggle for 40 minutes and then finally Move on. pull it out of the bag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, the golf one for me was a struggle. It took me a long time to get through those eight episodes. <laughs> the break point one I did pretty much in five nights. Just went bang, 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 because I really enjoyed that one. Formula One took me about three days. And for me, that's saying a lot because I have zero time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the test, the test was lucky in that. I'm not doing anything at work, so I watched it in a day at work. Um, yeah. Was 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 the the expert commentary uh, and the people that they got for that in the test and the the golf one um, quite strong as well? Because I found that you know when you hear from people like Will Buxton, I think his name is the the F1 commentary person. You know he's amazing. His his personality, his technical analysis is really interesting. He's great on camera. I always found I kind of leant forward in my seat when you had Roger Federer's coach and you had Andy Roddick and you had Maria Sharapova, you know, giving their expert opinion on one of the players and that kind of stuff. I thought they did that really, really well. Was that something that kind of translated into the other two as well? Roddick was a legend. He absolutely was so good on breakpoint. I like, he was amazing. Yeah. His insights. I was like, wow, I didn't rate him much as a player. I thought he was too robotic. But the insights that he provided, I was like, oh, okay, you actually, you, you're obviously a robot because you know the game so well. Like, <laughs> yeah, like he was really, really good. And I don't think the, I think the golf commentators were good, but I think they were hamstrung by the PGA. And the test, yeah. I don't know why um, Ashton Agar was on there so much as a common compare commentator or whatever. I don't really I, understand Maybe just because he was like, the 13th man for a bunch of the series. So he was like, he was in the, the locker rooms, but like not directly involved in like the games and stuff. Yeah, I didn't. That was about the only one that I was like, why are you talking? You, who, why are you here? Go away. <laughs> but other than that, I thought it was all right. Yeah. I liked um, Ian Rappaport on the full swing one. I thought he was yeah. interesting. Yeah, like I think that yeah, everyone got, else was kind of like, yeah. yeah, the girl Mel Lachlan or whatever, she is really, really good and she's really, really knowledgeable. But she didn't come across like that at all. She came across as a big fan. Yeah, which is she's not not right. Like she is, she is really, like, really good. Yeah, Rappaport came across as a legitimate like journalist who just so happens to live with one of the dudes which was weird yeah i don't know what's going on there but yeah <laughs> i'm like surely both of these guys can afford their own house <laughs> Whereas you, you juxtaposition that with the f1 one and the break point one and you've got roddick and sharapova and like um that uh what's her name the the female uh media girl um oh, oh yeah i know who you're talking about in the break point one yeah, yeah. Know, Caroline Ewan? Is that who it yeah, was? Yeah, that one. That one. Someone yeah, like that. That's it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, in the test, I think the most insane moment was uh, 
an emotional moment hearing Warney's voice. Ah, oh, that got me. That got me. Oh, that got me so yeah. well. I was like, really? Yeah, that got me. And I, I knew it was coming uh, too. As soon as they were in there, I'm like, oh, so oh this is going to suck. <laughs> yeah, that, as soon as that episode starts, it's like, oh, God, yeah. here we go. It's like, oh. Where's the tissues? <laughs> Like, no, 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 not again. I don't need this again. <laughs> and then even like Glenn Maxwell opening up about depression, that was pretty moving and a, like an important storyline in the test as well. Mm. Yeah, I think the, te- the test I did really well. Minus Labashane, he's a weird unit. <laughs> no wonder he gets along with Steve Smith so well. Like Have his uh, lunch prep before going out for a game. It's toasty in the fridge. <laughs> yeah, he makes uh, cheese toasties and then puts them in the fridge and then comes back to them for lunch. Oh, that sounds like something I'd do. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Just make a cheese sandwich. <laughs> no, but he likes the crunch. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, as soon as he did that, I was like, God damn, you're weird. I like the, I like the little Steve thing Smith about... Is a weirdo. Yeah, he's just strange. He's a weird cat. He, I like the, um, they relegated Boland to be sitting next to the coffee machine and stuff in his test because they didn't think he was going to play. And then he comes out and takes like mm-hmm. five for seven or whatever it was. Yeah, whoever gets stuck next to the, the coffee machine with Minus yeah. is just like, oh, yeah, this sucks. Yep. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, seeing Steve Smith like pull all the little like thumb caps out oh. of his gloves and like replace them with something else I was like, what the absolute hell? Like, how many have you got to do? Like, oh, 40 pairs? Yeah. Why do you just... have so many? Yeah. What I was, I, I, having, having not watched, having not watched the test, uh, the test one, what, um, did it give you any insight into the kind of athletes that the cricketers are? Because I think all the other sports that we've been talking about, you know, like the the tennis, you Davis, you just mentioned how hard it is to win those golf, you know, tournaments and how competitive it is and, you know, just how on your game you have to be. I've always found cricketers to be, you know, just that little bit more removed, let's say, from, you know, what a top tier athlete typically has to do and, you know, what their training regime has to be. Did it go into, you know, actually, yeah, the, you know, the Australian cricket team, some of the practices that they do are so intensive or, you know, was it, was there anything, anything like that that makes maybe an outsider like me to cricket go, holy shit, there is so much in being a professional, you know, uh, cricketer. Not yeah. in season two, there's a, there's a scene where we watch, <laughs> Maxwell and one of his other mates, like at a pub, having a schnitzel and beer. <laughs> yeah, no, oh, there's not even anything about athletes. facing. There's not even anything about facing 150k fast bowlers or anything crazy like that. There's just nothing. It's just like, yeah, they go out and they hit a little ball around and they come back in and they accelerate hundreds for some reason. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, nothing. and then you just you just see Steve Smith doing weird stuff to all his gear to like. <laughs> get in the game yeah. mentally like everything yeah, has to be I, I in like, like a certain spot like they're super superstitious like this has yeah to be here. i mean I feel these like gloves they, have to be all set up out in this way they they could have they could have uh they could have really really gone into that you know obviously there'd be such fine margins in where the ball hits the bat and you know how you face different bowlers and all of that kind of stuff i, I think i would find that really interesting so maybe a bit of a miss that they didn't uh they didn't cover any of the more technical mm-hmm. side of the sport in depth there's a couple of like yeah. moments going into like the tactics in the team meetings and stuff, but never like right. here's our crazy physical training regime or yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. And then you, or you even see just them talking. absolutely blow up in the locker room after getting out. But you don't know it's why. About as close as you get. They, like as Joey said, they don't yeah. explain. Well, okay, why is one of pissed off that he got out to that? Is it because he's passed his use by that and should have retired two years ago, or is it? which it is, but, oh, or is it because so it, <laughs> <laughs> tell us what you really think. <laughs> or like talking to Manus or Steve Smith about how do you face um, any of those Sri Lankan spin bowlers or sorry, Pakistani spin bowlers or how you face Stuart Board and James Anderson, like exactly as Joe is saying, where, where do you take your stance? How do you set up? Do you know what they're going to do? How do you, how do you prepare for the differences of that? Even between over to over going from pace to spin. 
Like, yeah. Yeah. New ball to old ball. How do you yeah, that, change when the new ball changes? It's definitely targeted to like hardcore cricket fans. It's not like yeah. your F1 for your casual viewer, which I think is, yeah, maybe a miss. Yeah. Gotcha. But then I think the same as Breakpoint and the golf one. I don't think they're targeted to the hardcore tennis and golf fans. Yeah, they're, like they're produced by Netflix. They're definitely trying to get the same sort of outcome yeah. that Drive to Survive had to 100%. bring in more new fans. Yeah, and I think that's part of the reason I didn't like the PGA one. Like I, I lived the PGA tour. I, I knew all I knew all the storylines that they were saying anyway before they really knew it. I mean, I didn't know Colin wouldn't have worn a white shirt with those pants, but I knew like <laughs> uh, I knew who won every one of those. You needed to know. <laughs> I knew who won every that's one of those. Tournaments. That's important information. I remember watching <laughs> the shot that Mito hit to lose that that PGA. I remember watching that shot that Matt Fitzpatrick hit to win the US. I remember watching Rory lose the Open to Cam. I remember watching um, Tony Finau go on that tear of three wins in five events or whatever the hell it was. Like, I, I watched them all. And so I wanted to see more of like the break point one did of, oh, I got so close, but I, I just like I got nervous on the 14th tee or I got, I got like the watching the, uh, Taylor Fritz one where he beat Nadal in the final at Indian. Watch him going, holy shit! I, I'm playing Nadal in my home event. Like, uh, I, I'm yeah, so I'm nervous. Just... I don't know what to do. Like, that's what I was hoping for. And the then, golf he got, then he got injured I, in like warm up too, which was yeah, really and then had to come over yeah. and yeah, like, and I didn't get any of that. Like the Mito, the Mito episode in full swing was good to watch him just go. I fucking lost this. Like that was one of the best lines in the series. Um, yeah, that one was a good episode because it showed him he, he should have won that. There's no, it, yeah, he should have won that hands down. The fact that Thomas won it from seven shots back is ridiculous, mm-hmm. uh, which in itself is ridiculous, but they didn't even really go into that too much. Like, that, yeah. I just played it down as like, great. yeah, he just played good golf like he normally does. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, which, yeah, they, they, I think they missed a, a big, big trick to to do the same thing that Breakpoint did and go into that other stuff. Seeing a, that drive that Mito hit that, like, sent him on that spiral in that tournament. That was Even terrible. me, as, like, a layman's golfer that just, like, maybe hits a golf ball every now and then, I watched that and was like, he hit that bad. That was yeah. that looked That looked <laughs> shocking. Yeah. That was terrible. <laughs> Did not look good at all. Yeah, no, the sawn off bloody follow through is just so scared of hitting it where he hit it that he just couldn't commit mm-hmm. to not hitting it there, and it just went straight there. <laughs> um, as a golf fan, do they the women's tournaments don't run like simultaneously? Like that's a totally different tour, isn't it? It's a completely different tour. It's very different to the, the tennis, and very different to other sports in that it is a completely different tour. It's even run. Yeah, it's I not know. even run by the PGA. Yeah, it's a total different organization. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I love. That's what I liked about Breakpoint. How they did incorporate both of the men and the women into the same like show. I thought that was important for the idea of tennis being a, a sport for everyone. Yeah, yeah. I think they did do that really well. And, and again, you know, they, I think the, the people that they chose to focus on had really interesting stories as mm. well. You know, I think you found yourself in the show kind of rooting for them if you'd never even heard of them before just because of the way that they kind of built up their, their character and their personality. That, like, that Ons Jabeur episode, that was one of the best episodes. I love that episode. Mm-hmm. That was so yeah. good. I loved Sack. Zachary as well, the the, the Greek yeah. lady, she was she was amazing. Yeah. Just seeing, you know, some of her training regimes in the oh. gym, you're like, wow, you are a beast. Yeah, like, yeah. she's a yeah, weapon. she was incredible. Those guys, yeah. they go crazy in the gym. Yeah. I did like the uh, Tom Lanovich, the girl, and yeah. she dating Berrettini. So she was at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the Australian. Yeah. yeah, I thought that was. Oh, interesting, she's not anymore, though. is she? No. Yeah. I think they broke up during the season. That's awkward. Right. Oh, maybe that'll be in a part two. <laughs> that was another thing. Yeah. Why did they split that into two oh. two parts? Yeah. Like it was all filmed last year. It's not like it was filmed recently. 
No, the second part's going to be sick. Wimbledon for no points. The rise of Alcaraz. Like, yeah. it's going to be awesome. Yeah, I actually so watched second, his match the other day where he the lost. The second half run. has Wimbledon, Eastbourne, the Queen's Club, the US Open, and the WTA and ATP finals. Like, that second mm. half is going to be nuts. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm excited for that second half of Breakpoint. And apparently the show's already been renewed for a second season. This year. So yeah. They must be filming again this year. Yeah, for good. The next year, which will be interesting. Uh, and this like I say, with the Berrettini and Tom Lanovic, <laughs> their yeah. hotel room was oh. atrocious. <laughs> the mess, right? Yeah. Like, no wonder you're not winning tournaments. You're going home to chaos. <laughs> I thought that exact thing. I was like, you got to prepare better at home. Seriously, like that's oh, a joke. God. How do you even no. find the, your stuff? Yeah. yeah. Every morning you're waking up being like, where's all my stuff? Got to get out of bed an hour earlier. I also also thought it was quite interesting to see the insight into the coaches and or lack thereof coaches. You know, so you've got like Taylor Fritz, who's got, you know, arguably one of the most successful coaches in in the world in terms of, you know, Sampras, Federer and now him. Then you've got uh, Zachary, who had the youngest coach on tour, who you know we were talking about earlier, and has to has the tactical genius to stand up in her uh, in her matches to throw her off. You're like, hey, cool, you know, I guess whatever works. And and then obviously, yeah, and then and then Kyrgios, you know, who who doesn't even have a coach. What? So, you know, it's it's interesting to see in the next you know two years or so whether there's quite different um, you know patterns or progression of success between players like that because obviously yeah they're all taking very different approaches to you know how they how they train and, and how they you know kind of analyze their games and that kind of stuff I wonder then, if a yeah. lot of that but yeah. Dorsa training with her partner <laughs> that's got to be yeah weird. it's got to be weird I wonder if a lot of that comes back to mm. like coaches weren't allowed to do anything during matches until recently. Yeah, and so I wonder, changed, that, it? yeah, like I, I don't need a really good coach because I can't do anything in the match and outside of the match. I'm a good enough tennis player that I know what I'm doing yeah. wrong or I just need someone to hit with to, to show me what I'm doing wrong. I mean, obviously that's, obviously that's incorrect, that statement, but like professional athletes think different to normal people. Like, it could yeah. just be a thing of well, I don't need him in the match, so why do I need him outside of it? Mm-hmm. Especially like, yeah, when you like tennis is a weird one where you do need that mm. hitting partner. Like you need another player to train mm. with, and it's yeah. Yeah, generally yeah. someone that you're going to be later competing against. Yeah, yeah, it's strange. Um, and then like with the coaching, the uh, Felix yeah. episode where he's coached by Tony Nadal. <laughs> What a nightmare situation that was. <laughs> I love Tony saying, he's like, oh, no, I'm coaching Felix, so I'll leave that. And, and Rafa just does himself. I'm like, sure, buddy, sure. You definitely want Rafa to win. <laughs> well, he even said that to the press. I'm like, good dude. Think Slight that, conflict of interest here. Yeah. press before the match. Like, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, just a little bit. But then Felix taking him as his coach. Nadal's one of the best players in the world. If, yeah. At some point, you're going to have to play him in a big match and you're going to yeah. come up against him. And You know there's coach... going to be that weird conflict at some point. So, I mean, I guess you just say up front, okay, cool. You're going to go mm. for Rafa? No worries. Uh, get me to that point and I'll do it from there. Like, yeah. It's not as if yeah. it just suddenly snuck up on him. Like, it's Rafael Nadal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, interesting. Um, did you... So... Joe, have you seen uh, I think I watched of half of Drive it, to Survive maybe well? three or four episodes, and I realized that that season, so the, the year before, I watched, I think, every single Grand Prix. So I didn't find it. it I, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. I was going to say it's probably the Australian, uh, the Australian Grand Prix yeah. is probably the only one yeah. I didn't watch. It was on at five o'clock in the morning. Um but yeah, like you know, we we have uh, practice is you know oh, Friday afternoon. Oh, did uh, the qualifying is usually between one p.m. and three p.m. on a Saturday, and Grand Prix is usually three or five p.m. on a Sunday. So it's quite easy to to make time to to watch it. And I found that exactly as as you were saying earlier, Davis, when you know 
who's going to win when you know, you know, they're building up to a dramatic moment and you already know the outcome. For me, it just wasn't anywhere near as, as entertaining, particularly when, you know, this has now been five seasons of watching uh, Drive to Survive. It's a, you know, it's, it's a repeated format. And, you know, I feel like I know the team so much better. I know the technicalities of it so much more. So yeah, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't get into it as much. And I think because they release it so close to, uh, the season actually starting, the, the next race season starting, I felt like I either had to binge it all and then, you know, before the race or, you know, once the actual next season started, I wasn't that interested in, you know, watching watching what happened for the, the past season. So, yeah, watched a few, didn't didn't love it and, and couldn't couldn't find myself to go back to it. Yeah, I think that's them, like, their, like, weird marketing tactic. They're like, hey... Yeah, I remember what happened. But last it was, year it was, now we've got the new season coming. So. Yeah, it's like yeah. a recap of the season. Previously but it was like a week. It was like a week before, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, Maybe two much. weeks at most. So it felt like a lot of content to get through in a in a relatively short amount of time. Yeah. 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 I liked. Yeah, maybe released was, it a couple of weeks earlier. Yeah, I was excited about this season just because it or this like season of the show because it was recapping the year where yeah. they made all of those really drastic changes to the regulations and the designs of cars. And I remembered like Mercedes and everyone struggling with yeah. porpoising and then seeing some of that footage, no wonder they were struggling hardcore yeah. and Lewis was complaining about having a see, yeah. back all the time. <laughs> yeah. So no. is that not normal? Because they're all no. just shaking. Cra- no. I'm just like, wow, that's hectic. Yeah. You watch previous seasons and their head is just like solid. They're like, yep, sweet. Yeah, right. It's cool. I can I turn like, my head. I can drive. This one, they hit a straight. So I like, drive. Yeah. <laughs> like, how do you drive that thing doing 300k an hour and yeah. your head's shaking around like a bloody tin can in a washing machine? <laughs> yeah, and then you're trying to spot yeah. the apex of a corner as you yeah. jump on the brakes. I think it, I think it would have yeah, also been more interesting if there was more of a battle at the top, right? Like just knowing that. You know, Max is just going to run away with everything. Almost every race made it. Uh, I guess you know, put more emphasis on the the midfield or the or the bottom battles that that happened. But yeah, I think you know, the, what's always the most interesting is who's going to be on the podium, and that was a pretty consistent story last uh, last year. I'm, I must admit, even for me, having never watched a single race and even just following that episode that season, <laughs> I was just like, oh look. Max, Max wins again. Yeah. Yeah. Red Bull are running away with the constructors. Cool. Yeah. At least the season before yeah. was better when, like, Indeed. Mercedes and Red Bull sure. were toe to toe swapping wins and races. Um, yeah, like it was really good in that last episode seeing, um, uh, was it Haas and that other team fight for like third or fourth or something? Yeah. That was cool. And I was like, okay, yeah. And they built up throughout the whole season that I was kind of interested in both teams. And I was like, yeah, sweet. Let's see. Come on. Who wins this? Who's got the better tactics? And then, as you were saying earlier, actually talking about the tactics of the race and and the, the tactics on the day and when to change tyres and when to pit and whether to stay on slicks or, or all of that or whether they've got DRS enabled and, and all this sort of stuff. I was like, yeah, okay, cool. That That's interesting. Like I go, had to Google what DRS was. But yeah. Um, oh, all this sort of stuff, <laughs> yeah. And but the reason, like, I had to Google it is that I hadn't watched previous seasons, and I was yeah. perfectly okay with going. I don't know what this is. I'm going to find out. I'm not expecting yeah. coming in at season. I five don't need to be explained to every everything. episode. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. unlike the golf one, where they had to explain the cut every single episode. <laughs> um, yeah, I liked the battle between Alpine and McLaren, and the uh, contract issue with yeah. what was his name. Piastri. Piastri, yeah. That was a massive couple yeah. of episodes. That was huge. <laughs> they threatened to, Alpine threatened to sue McLaren over. I was like, oh, God. I, that got me so interested, probably because he's Australian, that I actually Googled what happened before it came out in the season because I was like, I, I don't know when I'm going to get to watch the next episode. I need to find out what's going on here. And so, yeah, I had mm-hmm. to Google it and be like, oh, okay, that's what happened. Cool. <laughs> yeah, they, did they end up like, no, they, they wanted to give McLaren were like, oh, we'll just yeah. give you Ricardo and Alpine were like, we don't want Ricardo. <laughs> they went and got they went and got my favourite driver, Pierre Gasly. Yeah. <laughs> good, good looking rooster that fella. <laughs> <clears throat> the 
the, the Mick Schumacher episode was also interesting as well, where he was struggling and just crashing constantly. Yeah. Not small crashes. Like, yeah, I would have, like, I would have, I would have, I would have, he would have got at least one more season because even though he wasn't performing very well, you would have thought that the marketing money that his name would bring to that team would just be absolutely huge. And I would have thought, you know, he's probably comparable in terms of the money he's bringing in to someone that's performing at the mid table level. So I was quite shocked when they were like, yeah, no, actually we're getting, we're getting rid of him. Getting rid of him is out. But how much of that can they use? Yeah, because yeah, they have the, the yeah, because uh, they've got the budget, the budget cap now. It's all well and good to be bringing in three hundred million, yeah. but if you've only got twenty that you can, uh, obviously it's more than twenty. But if you've only yeah. got X <laughs> that you can spend on the car, and he's writing half your budget off every week, you're like, well, hang on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm getting super rich issue. because of his last name. Like, <laughs> yeah, okay. but I can't help my team. <laughs> and they were talking, like he had another crash in the uh, what's his name? The owner was Gunther yeah. was just like. I think oh, I think my favorite my favorite uh, scenes in in that <laughs> show is always when uh, when uh, Gunter has to go call Jean. He's like, "Oh fucking hell, I gotta go call Jean again," and you just know he's gonna get an absolute <laughs> belting through the phone. <laughs> like this, this poor guy, <laughs> yeah. he crashed the car again. Yeah, <laughs> I loved when they interviewed him and they asked him uh, if I, if you could get points from this race. What would you have done this time last paddock. year? And he was like, I'd have fucked the whole, the whole paddock for that. And then, the, and then someone goes, he goes, oh, sorry about the language. And the report says, sorry about the language. He's like, language? What did I say? Language. <laughs> so, good job, good job. Uh, um, yeah. I'm so excited cool. for the, the next season too, like this year where they've added yeah. Vegas to the I mean they I think they've already got enough material be, for I mean particularly race. after today they've, they've got enough material for, for a good few episodes and I mean that it's it, hopefully they, they go into the changes that Aston Martin have made because all of a sudden out of nowhere they're you know they're, they're podium competitive and you're like what they were nowhere mm. last year mm. and you know amazing to see someone like Fernando Alonso behind a car that you know is actually performing but you can see Stroll Stroll's right up there as well so you know obviously that car is just incredible the changes that they've made so yeah that that'll be super interesting at the start of next year mm. that's one of the funnest things with f1 like a team can go from absolutely struggling yeah. the next year they come back with a For brand sure. new car and it's like oh look we're good again what happened well, and then you just got red bull who are just always good yeah i read something that aren't they bringing in either this current f1 season or the next one a um or they might have brought in the last season. The amount of time you can spend in an aerodome yeah. changes depending on where you place yeah, in that... the previous season. Oh, I'm not sure about that. I know they changed like last year was when they brought in the, the salary cap basically on the budget spending. They changed a whole bunch of the regulations and they changed like yeah, how much that, time they... you could spend in practice and actually yeah, no, working I re... on the car like they have that off season where nobody's allowed to technically touch the car. Yeah. Yeah. I read something about that in a wind tunnel, you only get whatever it is, 10 million seconds in a wind tunnel or whatever. But if you come first in a constructors championship, you get 10 million and 10. And if you come yeah, last, they, you get 10 million and 90. Yeah. And, they, and it's to try yeah, and they've been level talking it all up. Trying now about trying to introduce yeah. rules where, you know, the lower you finish, the, the more, uh, benefits you try and get for the next year. Cause obviously, you know, every the FIA just wants to make it, you know, at, while still being safe, the most competitive it, it can, it can be. And that was why last season was so interesting because it was finally like cars could, yeah. could stay close once they'd been overtaken. So it made it a lot more, a lot more interesting. So yeah, I, I expect over the coming years, they'll continue to try and bring in rules that will, you know, bunch, bunch everyone up and make everyone a bit more competitive because that is the one kind of downfall of, of F1, isn't it? That, you know, when a team's dominant, no one can, no one can touch them. And then it's just not, not interesting. No, touch it. Yeah. Well, we saw that and in the Australian changed. Grand Prix today. Like Verstappen had an eleven-second yeah. lead there for until there was that oh. big crash. I'm like, oh, this is that, boring. The one last year was it the Japan one where it pissed down. 
it was bucketing. And Verstappen polled one and just yeah. led from start to finish because he's the only one that could see. He was the only one that could see. Yeah. Everyone else is like, I can't see shit. Verstappen's like, this is easy. I've got nothing. And everyone else is yeah. just like, I can't see the front of my car. Like, <laughs> this, this is terrifying. There's a corner here somewhere, I know, but I don't know where it is. <laughs> yeah. It's just spray in front of me. Yeah. Yeah. I, know. But yeah, I, I think it would be back. interesting if they made like, the yeah. sun, like even the, the budget cap or something, like a sliding scale where the higher you finish, the lower your budget, and then the lower you finish, the higher your budget, mm. so you can actually... Yeah, or, or even even if they made it a, a similar season, system so. to, like, the the NBA draft where, you know, you, if you've got an outgoing driver, you get first pick of anyone from F2 or F3, so, you know, you can get the best young drivers coming through or, you know, it might be a bit difficult to do, but some, something like that. Yeah. That See... I, that's a hard one to do, as you said, because like, if they're driving in a shit car in F2, they're not going to be placing well, are they? So <laughs> how do you know yeah, that he really is just, a good driver if he's driving a shit car? Even if they just allow the, the yeah. teams to have the pick take of the drivers first, yeah. that are coming up yeah. rather than, yeah. oh, you just have to take yeah. the guy that won every time. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, rather exactly. than Red Bull writing a check for whatever to get him to come to Red Bull. Yeah. Yeah. Even McLaren, they just wrote a massive check <laughs> yeah. for Piastri and like, we're going to take him off you. <laughs> Alpine's like, uh, oh. he's under contract. No, he's not. Yeah, he's, he's contracted to us. <laughs> what contract? Yeah. That was a whole scandal. <laughs> he just jumped on Twitter and was like, I'm not under contract. I'm not driving for that. Yeah. Like, oh, God. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I'm excited Bizarre. for the Vegas race, though. I'm, after being to Vegas last year and, like, walking down that strip, watching a Formula yeah, One awesome. race down that road is just going to be nuts. Alrighty. So in terms of top choice for show, Davis, which one are you picking? Purely for weight of what it did is, is our drive to survive for me. I, I think probably yeah, break what point you, because it wasn't what I was expecting. Um, I did find it a bit slow at times, but yeah, it's, it's been, it's gotten, it's reinvigorated my interest in tennis because I think I've thought for quite a while, I haven't been as interested. It's the same three guys that have just have won everything for the last 10 years. This has got me excited to be like, right, there's some amazing people coming up and, you know, we've, we're going to be pretty lucky in terms of the talent that we get to, that we get to watch fighting for those top spots. So yeah, that was, that was a break point for me, I think. It didn't even go yeah, into Alcaraz exactly. yet. Yep. It didn't even go into Alcaraz. Alcaraz I was just about to say, I'm true. sensing an Alcaraz fan that here. That guy is insane. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll be interested yeah, to see what, for sure. what our players they sign up for season two. Now see if we like get some of those big names yeah. after seeing a first season. Like, okay, yeah, we'll get involved this time. Hmm. Um, yeah. For me, I... Drive to Survive, for me, since it began, has been an instant, like, as soon as they drop it, okay, drop everything, any other show you're watching, that can wait. Let's power through Drive to Survive, and I think because it's just so thrilling to watch every episode, purely because of the nature of Formula One, like, even if you know the stories, you're still going to get to see some crazy racing action and probably some big crashes, and then... Punto and yet. Toto and the <laughs> Red Bull guy just flipping there. Yeah, it is hard to beat. In the, in the uh, uh, Christian Wolf's the best. He's... I would, I'd like to put an honourable so mention for break Christian point in as well. the team it meeting was... about porpoising just being like in the in the team like meeting when Toto's like, oh, we need to do something about the porpoising issue, and Toto was just like, uh, Christian, like, <laughs> you got a problem? Just fix your fucking car. <laughs> you don't need to change the rules. You just need to fix your car. <laughs> yeah, Fair that was best. It's just like, oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> and then I also find it funny that every time, like, Christian's at home, it's just like randomly Jerry <laughs> Halliwell from the Spice Girls. Yeah, she does make a few good cameos. <laughs> um, I do, I do have a, uh, I've, I've got a, a, a last, a last question to, yeah. to put you both on the spot because I've been thinking about as we'll probably see more of these kind of shows come out, oh is there any other sports that haven't been done that you think would, would work really well? 
because one that I'd be super interested in, and I'm not sure if it's if it already exists, not not to my knowledge, but is cycling. So doing one partic- particularly focused on the Tour de France, I think would be so interesting because there's so much like in the technology of the bikes and those guys are just such insane athletes. And there's also so many different, you know, sprinter versus the the endurance stages and the time trials. And, you know, I, I think there's quite a lot of, of technical stuff that they could go into because even though I'm a cyclist, I still – you know, find it quite hard to watch because I'm not, you know, familiar with the the intricacies of of how the the whole um the whole tournament works. So yeah, I think cy- cycling would be a, a quite an interesting one. I think. And Ben, what would you choose? Off the top of my head, <laughs> I, I'm not really sure. I, I it, it all depends on the way it's delivered. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to see a snowboarding one. I really would love to see a snowboarding one. But I don't know how you do it, and that's that's the problem. Yeah, that'd be <laughs> interesting. Um, I'm trying to think. I watched one recently that was like extreme sports. That was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, for me, I would love. Yeah. Oh, kind of already got it. A wrestling one, but there's a show AEW All Access now, which is kind of this situation where it's it shows you what they go through in like terms of training and on show day. And then it's also like their backstory. And at the moment it's talking to this guy that's <clears throat> dealing with, he got two yeah. really bad concussions in the space of three weeks and he was out for like six or seven months. So it's focusing on his comeback, but I also in terms of like a full on hardcore sport, I reckon a darts one would be pretty cool. Cause some of those yeah. dudes are like crazy characters and, they're traveling all over Europe and Britain every single week playing. Yeah, games. They're, they're, I'm, I'm sure they'd be big, big personalities. Games. And similarly, like what, what seems to be making the recipe for these shows to be successful is that, you know, there's only probably, I imagine in the darts world as well, there's probably only 20 or 30 guys that are at the very, very top, right? And they're probably the ones that are making heaps of money. And to crack into mm-hmm. that would be so, so hard. So, you know, the the yeah, looking at the up and comers and versus the, the guys that have consistently been at the top, like I could see that working. All righty. Yeah, that's, so, yeah, that's, that's, shout, that's yeah. our sports themed episode. Thank you everyone for listening to the commentary booth. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to rate review and subscribe on podcast services and on YouTube. You can follow Ben on Instagram at BJD 517. You can follow Joey on Instagram at Penny Colladas with an underscore. And you can follow me on social media at Jamie Apps Media and at Pario Magazine. Thanks, guys, for jumping on and catch you on Thanks, guys. the next Good to chat. sports-themed craziness. Thank you guys. Thanks for having me. The Commentary Booth is a fan-funded production of Jamie Apps Media. You can support the podcast alongside our magazine, Pario Magazine, on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Jamie Apps Media. The following people supported at the publisher level or higher, and you cannot fathom how incredibly appreciative we are for their support.